Thank you for coming out. It's a uh, classic car restoration club, live Q and a, and, uh, you know, per usual, you know, we're running into our, uh, you know, our usual technical difficulties. So we're, we're actually working off the laptop today. So hopefully that works for you guys. Um, the, uh, again, feel free to make sure you, uh, type your, uh, ask your questions down below. We've got a box on there. Just enter the, the questions and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to them as soon as we get them. The, uh, also, you know, we've got uh, 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 some uh, questions that have been asked by members and submitted via email ahead of time. Uh, we'll make sure that, you know, we'll get a lot of those answered tonight as well. Uh, a little update here. We finally had decent weather here in Minnesota, which is unusual at this time of year. And, uh, you know, it brings everybody thinking about cars again all of a sudden because right. we finally got, like, warm weather. Uh, actually, it was, you know, in the 40s. And for Minnesota, that's, that's you know, as soon as it hit, the temperature gets to 40 degrees, then you roll down the windows and you crank up the heat and you drive around with your winter coat on, <laughs> acting like it's summer. Summer. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, summer to us. It, yeah, it's, it's almost like summer. It, it, you know, it gives you a chance to think about what's coming. So, you know, that's the great thing about having, you know, seasons as pronounced as we do here is that, you know, any change, you know, is a welcome change. Um, the uh, Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. We're, uh, you know, we'll do our best to get to them. Uh, the first one up, of course, we um, we have a friend who has a 2007 Mustang convertible, maroon in color. I'm told that all the paints in the red spectrum peel. Uh, they're clear coat after a few years. I don't necessarily think that's a red spectrum issue. I've had you know seen plenty of silver and gray mm -hmm. and black, and I've got a you know. Uh, the from, is there a colors. combination that will keep, is there a combination that will keep the clear coat on? Uh, a lot of the clear coat adhesion issues are going to come down to exposure to sunlight. You know, mm -hmm. it's the UV that, that kills that adhesion more than anything else. The dark colors. Uh, it, you know, it keeping, of course, keeping, keeping the finish waxed and clean and, you know, the, the common sense kind of things help. But is there uh, is there a magic uh, cure for it? You know, the best thing to do is you know if if you're not driving it, if you have like a shady spot or if you got a garage or uh, something to store it in, the best thing that's going to keep that paint on the car is not exposing it to sunlight. Yeah, not always possible if you're going to go out and enjoy your car. Yeah. So yeah, and usually what comes up is people saying, "What can I put on it to you know make it look better?" Well. Uh, you know, uh, once it's peeling, yeah, you know, once it's peeling, there's not a lot you can do. You know, there's, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, sometimes it just kind of oxidizes and it gets kind of white and chalky looking, and sometimes you can buff some of that stuff back some, but it's still not going to be like a new finish. So, uh, ultimately, you know, a lot of times, if you want it to look like new, you're going to have to, you're going to end up having to repaint it anyways, and you know, it's not. I know that's not what anybody wants to hear, you know, they want to hear, you know, there's a, you know, buy this bottle of stuff, spread it on your car and suddenly it's like new again. But, you know, if that just doesn't happen. Uh, we've got a few members coming in from the, uh, from some of our, uh, uh, through our email. Again, if you have any questions that you want to ask right now that pertinent to what you're working on, feel free to type them down below and we'll get those answered. Uh, Ross has one uh, we got from a member who's got a... It's a 64 Chevy Impala Super Sport Convertible. I want to take the sway out of it, the front and rear suspensions. I'm looking for some guidance just it's or just a daily street driver. Okay, so he's not a performance car, but he wants right. to, you know, in those, you know, uh, I had a 63 Chevy Impala, and I believe you had a 64. I had a 64. Very and, nice cars. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, the, the great thing about those cars, I remember back in high school, was that, you know, you could drive, you know, the suspension was fairly soft in those. 
And while, you know, they were never like considered like a real corner carver, but you could go over the roughest of roads and it would just drive like a cloud. Yeah. But if you want it to handle and actually drive nice, I would suggest, you know, coilovers. I mean, coilovers, coil overs with you know, bigger or, sway bars. And, or, yeah, you just, uh, yeah. front and rear sway bars. Yeah. Probably, That'd be the cheapest, probably the cheapest to way with. to go. You just start with like a good, like a sport uh, yeah. sway bar. And that's a big car. It, you know, you, it's going to take a hefty sway bar yeah. to keep that thing from, you know, rolling on the corners. But to have your bushings that jump on. And, yeah, uh, like that. uh, that's probably where I would start with, uh, you know, make sure I have, you know, fresh shocks in it and start with a sway bar. And then if I, you know, if you feel, still felt you wanted more, less sway, you could go with a stiffer spring or even yep. coilovers. Yep. Cool. The uh, uh, question I've got in was, uh, what is the typical starting point? For a restoration, body, interior, powertrain, suspension, all of the above, and you know, I, I think that's a thing that we all think about when you start restoring a car. What should you take care of first? You know, and uh, you know, usually the interior is the last thing. Right. Everything else gets done before the interior, interior and bottom up, all of that. And so normally what you do is take your before and you don't want to be working on the engine and all that after you get like the body all finished and sprayed and everything else. So normally the, the common way to do it is first take care of all the mechanical stuff. Make, make sure all the mechanics of the car are, are functional, you know, that your doors open and close properly so the hinges aren't drooping. Make sure that your engine is working properly. Make sure your transmission's working properly. Make sure trunk and hood and all the, the mechanical aspects of the car are working properly. You know, you still, you know, even if you get your engine, you know, all rebuilt and all together and make sure that it's all working fine, then you can always take your engine back out of the car and paint the whole car. Then you're only putting it in there once and everything's going to work fine. So typically it goes, you know, the mechanics of it, you know, the, whether it be the doors and doors and hoods and all the mechanical functions as well as engine and transmission and rear axle, make sure all that stuff's working right. Then start addressing things like the body. And then, you know, from as soon as the body's done, then you go, you know, body and glass. And then you take in the last thing typically is the interior itself. And, you know, uh, just because, you know, the interior usually can blast because you don't want to mess up the interior with all the other stuff you have going on. You don't want to like get paint or grease or whatever mm -hmm. on your interior while you're restoring other aspects. I think to the extent of the restoration. I mean, yeah. if you're going to do a frame off, obviously. Yeah. And that, that would be if I was doing a complete restoration, you know, not all cars need a complete no. restoration. Some, you know, some cars have beautiful original interiors and why would you want to, you know, mess with your interior if you've, uh, you know, you've oh, got yeah. a clean interior, yeah. it might just take some clean and, you know, it might be the kind of thing where you just want to get it out of the car until, you know, you can, uh, yeah, uh, finish the other aspects of the restoration. But I've done, certainly done plenty of cars where they just needed, you know, parts. You know, they either needed just paint, bodywork, engine ran fine, mm -hmm. uh, the mechanics worked fine, and uh, so it's just a matter of you know, assess your car and you know, start with you know, start with the mechanical parts for it. The uh, I did have a question about one of the videos on our site. We have a, a video on the site on uh, building custom car uh, door panels. And the, the question what came in about, you know, what size staples did I use? Because we were using uh, one eighth inch uh, ABS panel board plus the, you know, plus padding and uh, vinyl and everything. We used three sixteenth staples on that, stainless staples on that. We usually use stainless staples just because we don't want uh, – we, you don't want any moisture and stuff in the air to actually cause those staples to start rusting. And then, you know, uh, you've seen that on interiors before where yeah. suddenly you start having, you know, rust creeping out in the interior. And it's like, why is that there? And usually it comes down to things like staples. Uh, the auto manufacturers are not very good about using uh, <laughs> uh, things that won't rust, you know, and, and it's kind of, it's kind of unique like that, you know, it's like, uh, 
think about all the cars that are out there where, you know, if you ever looked under the dash of a 70s car, there's like a lot of times you'll see like some rust in there. And that's because like a lot of that stuff under the dash was never primed or, right. you know, painted or anything. Steel. It was just raw metal. So as time goes by, you know, it's like suddenly you look under there and there's like, you know, orange cakey rust. And it's like, you know, it's like, is this urban in a swamp? And it's like, no, the metal was never sealed up Obviously, to start yeah. with and you know that's not uncommon you know especially in the seven you know in the yeah. six, late 60s 70s you know it's like you know even going back earlier than that you know it's like when we did the restoration on the the 57 DeSoto, it was like we, a few of the purists gave us you know a little bit of heat because the underside of the hood was never painted on a 57 DeSoto. It was just uh, the top of the hood was painted, the sides were painted, and whatever overspray went What's under there? the hood is what was, you know, it had it had primer, but it just didn't have any paint in there. Well, just because, you know, I, I understand that, a, you know, purist. a purist or a concourse restoration, you know, you want to get the right amount of overspray and all that. I know uh, we have friends that, you know, pursue getting the right amount of overspray on stuff but in our in our case it's like you know the car is meant to be a driver we just you know we don't want to worry about you know rusting or having issues with the the having any kind of issues whatsoever uh next question i have from fellow member is uh i have a 1956 bel air with a front bench seat i have come up i have come up with front buckets out of a 2004 MDX, it's a Toyota. Toyota. It's like a Toyota SUV, right? SUV. Okay. Is there any universal mounting hardware, uh, or someone that is familiar with building in building hardware? You know, I, if I I doubt there's a universal mounting kit to go from a 2004 MDX to a 56 Bel Air if it out there it would surprise me uh, but it's not uncommon for guys to put later model seats into their cars if they're building a uh, you know a, a resto custom. mod or a custom car of some sort uh, but m almost always you're gonna have to fabricate brackets you know and you know, I've seen, I've had plenty of cars where I've bought them and they've fabricated stuff in it. You know, some of them can be kind of crude, you know, little blocks of little blocks of square tubing that have been, you know, welded together. Signpost. And, and yeah, signposts. <laughs> I have seen that. experience. <laughs> I have seen that recently. <laughs> so, yes. Um, uh, you're going to have to do some fabrication to get, you know, because the floor contours on a MDX are going to be different than the floor contours of a 56 Bel Air. Um, you know, you're ultimately going to have to do some fabrication somewhere, whether it be spacers or actually cutting and, and modifying the seat brackets that are there for the MDX. Um, Easy. I know we want to all think about things always being in kit form, but there are some things in the hobby where you're going to have to either do some mod you know, do some fabrication yourself, or you know, find a good fabricator, uh, you know, hot rod shop or a, you know, a customizer in your area, and you know, tell them what you want to do. A lot of times, you know, simple project like that where they're not doing like real fancy high end fabrication, you know, they'll they'll do it relatively inexpensively. And they'll have the equipment to do a good job at it. So, yeah, you know, gauge what you have in tools and what you need done. And in you know, sometimes you're you're better off to just pay somebody else to do it. Unfortunately, you know, that's the case. Or you know, take the time and you know, figure out what if you know. I'm I'm always one to you know go buy tools before I uh, you know uh, pay somebody else to do it. Yeah. But, uh, but it's just a mindset thing, you know, it's like some guys don't want to, you know, they're, if they're not going to do a lot of welding or fabrication, they don't want to invest in, you know, the, the equipment, but, uh, you know, let that kind of be your, your, uh, uh, guide and, and what you do. But, uh, uh, yeah, it, it sounds like a fun project, you know, be, you know, make sure you, you know, 
send in some pictures of it, post them in the, the member ride section. After you get it all done, we'll be happy to take a look at it. And, and I'm sure fellow members will too. Okay. This question's an earlier question. Yeah, uh, we have a, yeah, we, well, yeah, I saw that one. And it was uh, up on our new product page here. Was, uh, the Daytona Jack. There was a Daytona Jack listed in the new product section. He was asking, where can you buy them? Looks like you got back to it, um, Harbor Freight. Yes. You know Harbor Freight. Harbor Freight's a good place. <laughs> Uh, and and yeah, it's a listing on the in our new product section on the website. Uh, yeah, Harbor Freight has actually done a, done a good job of kind of upping their quality on a lot of stuff lately. And uh, you know, it used to be all their stuff would break about the time you put it in the car and drove back to your place. <laughs> and uh, but now they've really kind of up the up the ante, and they've. Uh, I have some good some, stuff. There's some decent tools in there, you know. I, I'm not gonna, you know, I've bought a few Harbor Freight tools, and you know, maybe, maybe you don't use it enough to right. justify spending three hundred dollars for a snap-on one, but you can go buy one at Harbor Freight for you know twenty-five, and you're done, you know. And enjoy you get, the backyard you can. Yeah, and and most guys, yeah, a lot of guys, you know, I, I know pro pro mechanics that have a few Harbor Freight tools oh, yeah. in their box, you know. There, yep. some of those guys will hide them before they actually, you know, <laughs> let him else like see. <laughs> <laughs> keep keep it up. <laughs> but yeah, they're actually, you know, uh, we've had a lot of good tools come out of there lately. The uh, had uh, another friend, Mike, he's writing in. He wants to know, uh, He's uh, he's got a 1930 Model A, and he's looking for wheels that fit the stock hubs. That is, you know, to, to find nice wheels, you know, there are companies like wheelsmith.com uh, or .net, wheelsmith.net, thewheelsmith.net, and, you know, Wheel of Antiques, and I think Coker has some too. Uh, you didn't mention what style of wheel you were looking for, but you know, mostly guys are you know either looking for like 40 Ford style with this. The, the the early model A's are tough to fit, and the reason being it's a five on five inch bolt pattern, but the hub centric is bigger than anything on the road, you know, and usually what happens is uh, I know when guys were looking for, I used to have a set around here, was a set of steely wheels off a, you know, early, like a seven, early 70s Ford F1, F100. Yeah, and really that was a five on five inch bolt pattern, but what we had to do in order to get the hub centric to fit, we took a torch and we cut out the center of the hub centric just so we could get the wheel to actually bolt up flat because uh, on the early Model A's, they have quite a they get quite a taper that comes out around the, the center hub centric. So, in you know to get a stock set of wheels to fit, uh, you're gonna have you, you'd end up having to modify it. Uh, but I believe you know like companies like the Wheelsmith.net, you know you can get like a wheel that will fit that in uh, like a smooth steel or. You know some of the some of the popular kind of hot roddy kind of styles, but yeah, man, be aware that you know you're gonna have to. Uh, the, there's gonna be very limited choices of just stock wheels that are gonna fit a Model A. Uh, although, with that said, you know some of the early Mopar stuff, you know 30s Mopar stuff, but there's not, that's not real uh, accessible. Like uh, I know, a uh, popular one for a lot of the early Ford guys for a long time was like you know the early '30s artillery wheels that uh, were on Plymouths and Dodges, uh, just because they had that really big hub centric on them and the same five on five bolt pattern. So for the old hot rodders, they knew what those things were. Otherwise, you know, it it's it, there's not an easy simple solution to look for, but it, uh, they're out there, you know, you just gotta yeah. do, do a little digging around and, and find the exact wheel that you want. Um, 
the uh, again you know if you guys have any questions feel free we're, we're I'll, I'll keep checking them I'm not like I'm not just playing with my phone uh, <laughs> think uh, because because we had a couple of technical problems today we uh, are actually coming through using the laptop or laptop uh, camera um, and uh, you may see me fumbling with stuff and that's just because we're kind of working with what we have the uh, the next question we have coming up from a fellow member is uh, are the front fenders on a 66 dto the same as a 65 dto uh, no 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 it, it would be it's nice it would be nice the 65 gto is one that surprised me it's like it's an awesome car. I love the taillights on the 65 GTO, you know, and I, uh, there's so much I like about the 65 GTO and it's a little bit smaller than the 66, 67s. And uh, you know, I think it's, I, I love the 65 GTO, but it's like, has no aftermarket support. Right. It's like, you can't get, you know, it's hard to get fenders. You can, you know, it's the doors and stuff like that. Like, not like the 66, 67, yeah, which you can dang near buy an entire body. Uh, as far as the 65 GTO, uh, I think the only thing that you could fit off the 66 or 67 is the hood. And, you know, uh, granted it's not a big wear part, but if, you know, the hood fits, you know, you're, yeah. it's a big step in the right direction. I don't even think the bumpers, front no, bumpers are different. I don't, think, I don't think the bumpers will work or, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot different. The 65 is a GTA, 65 GTO, I think is an awesome car, but it's like they get almost no aftermarket support, and I can't explain that. There's a few cars like that. And when I'm thinking about that, you know, I've got a similar question from another member who wrote in and said, you know, uh, uh, can you help me find body parts for a 74 Torino? And the 74 Torino is an awesome car, you know, the big fastback GTs or the, the Cobras were, uh, they're nice ride. Those are yeah. some, those were, you know, a hot car in their day. I had one, a GT. Yep. Yeah. What'd you do? Nice. I took them all around. <laughs> <laughs> nice 351 in it. <laughs> and a lot of them had 351s you know, the or they had the 429s in those. And, uh, you know, there was some really, those were some really nice fast cars for their day. But, you know, unlike like a 70 Chevelle, 70 Chevelle, you can buy part, you could probably build the entire car without ever having to own one ding there. Um, but a 70 Torino is just not, it's kind of like 65 GTO, oh, yeah. you know, it just has not gotten a lot of aftermarket support yet. That's surprising. I mean, as far as, um, you know, 71 is a little different, you know, it's pretty close though. I mean, it's for body parts, but finding aftermarket stuff. And I know, well, and I, and I did a little research after, because when this one came up, I thought, there's got to be parts out there and it was like door, no. Although, you know, good original doors are bringing premium. Yeah. Um, but uh, Auto Metal Direct, Auto you know, Metal and you Direct. may have seen some of their, uh, uh, Craig Hopkins, some of his videos on the site. You know, Craig is sponsored by Auto Metal Direct. And, and uh, Auto Metal Direct has done a good job of supporting the aftermarket. And they've got a lot of steel stampings that, you know, you say, you know, nobody's got that. Then you know, dig around a little bit and you find out they do. But uh, I did see a posting that uh, coming in March that they were actually releasing new quarter panels for the 70 Torino. So, so you know, that'd be a big step in the right direction, getting quarter panels. Because, you know, quarter panels are the, like, you know, back in the early 70s oh, yeah. and late 60s, quarter panels are the first thing to rot out. All the wheel wells went out and then the, you know, the drop by the trunk in the back, those all rotted mm -hmm. up and, and uh, it's not, you know, it's not a dish on Ford, you know, whether you're to GM or Ford or Mopar, they were all rusting out in those places and back you, in those days. It's still buy OEM stuff. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, back then it wasn't as big of an yeah. issue because you could still, you know, go it's down to the dealer yeah. and buy one. Um, you, but, 
you know, nowadays it's, you know, even, uh, you know, we've got a 31 to Soto project over here. The XA, I was kind of surprised. I went down to the Napa to see what, you know, because years ago when I restored that car, I restored this car 40 years ago. And yes, 40 years ago. Yeah. And it was, yeah, gosh, I feel old now. But, um, and I stopped driving the car 30 years ago. And you would think, you know, for all my preaching and storing stuff properly, that this car would have been stored properly. It was not stored <laughs> properly. And, but, you know, the car has basically been sitting for 30 years. And uh, so I said, well, geez, you know, you, the last time I bought points and condenser and rotor and cap for this thing, it just went down to Napa. Well, in 30 years, they no longer make parts. For it. <laughs> <laughs> what a so, surprise! So, yeah, when I when I went to the uh, guy behind the counter and said, "Oh yeah, I need points and rotor and condenser," and yes. they kind of look gave me that kind of cross-eyed nice. look, like, "What? You want what for what?" And then I get, of course, I get the you know the young guy who says DeSoto, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> so I was stuck, you know, and it was. Yeah. Uh, I did find a new cap on Rock Auto. I was going to say, did you try Rock? I, they had a few parts. I was able to get spark plugs for a couple bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. I was able to get uh, a new distributor cap and a couple other little parts. Uh, no points? No points. So apparently I'll, I'll have to keep searching for, for new points. for a Might be filing them. But this is, a, you know, the same thing, you know, whether it be a 65 GTO, a 70 Torino, you know, the availability of parts and some of this, you know, some of the off brand, some of the, some of the stuff, it's just, you know, what you, you got used to being there, uh, you know, suddenly is not there anymore. And uh, so, you know, I'm a big advocate on having, you know, spare parts. So if you do, you know, if you do have a classic and, you know, you're, uh, uh, it's a good idea, especially wear parts like points and condensers. And if you're not going to upgrade to, you know, to uh, electronic ignition or something like that, you're better off to stock up. Uh, stock up. Get those, get those, uh, I, although I usually make fun of like Mopar guys because like, uh, they're the only guys that I know that will, you know, if uh, if they need of one or two spares, they'll have ten of them, and uh, <laughs> and if you need one and they have one, and they're not going to give you one either. <laughs> they won't sell you one. They, they, it's like, well, I need ten. I ran into a guy who had five radiators that I needed. I only needed one. I said, well, you'd be interested in selling one. He goes, no, I might need one, and it was like. Is he is he ever going to go through all of those radiators? <laughs> no, but there you yeah. have it. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you know how that goes. Um, okay, I have a, a gentleman that uh, wrote in says, uh, uh, "What's the most popular painting of the underbody of a seventy Nova?" I was thinking of using chip guard. This car will be a driver. Okay, chip guard, you know, chip guard, that's something that they started, uh, they started using it in the 80s. Um, I know I had a buddy with an 83 Hurst Olds, and I think the whole uh, bottom third of the car was painted with chip guard <laughs> underneath, you know. And it, <laughs> it's, kind of a, it's kind of a rubbery thing that kind of went under the paint, and some of times it's clear and they spray it over the paint. Nowadays they do a lot of that 3M stuff mm -hmm. where they kind of stick like the clear Some vinyl crap. stuff over it. Um, chip guard is, yeah, I, I, yeah, chip guard will work. Chip guard will do good. I, I've seen plenty of uh, uh, hot rods and restoration. You know, the rest of mod cars. I know, especially if they intend to drive them on the track or or do a lot of performance driving with them. They'll spray like the insides of the wheel wells with them, and that way, you know, little rocks and dirt and sand Shit. doesn't, you know, sand off all their uh, all the paint inside the wheel wells. You know, and it, and it can look good. It can look nice. You know, um, 
I know when my, when my son was working at the, the Roadster shop down in Elgin or Mundelein, Illinois, the, uh, uh, a lot of the cars that they had that were getting built for performance driving, and that was like on track kind of stuff, were, you know, really nice, you know, six figure cars. A lot of times they would spray the undersides of the body with Linex. The the st same stuff that yeah. they use in like uh, line in your box uh, your truck. The, yeah bed truck liners <laughs> and uh, and and you would think that would be just incredibly heavy and insane amount but you know they don't like put on a half you know, half inch thick of it but they do spray the underside of the car you know before they put in all the exhaust and everything else and it kept. You know, when the cars were driven hard on the track and everything else, it kept, you know, the underside looking fresh. I don't know. I'm not, I, I know when I was out in Wyoming last time, I saw guys out there that would cover their entire, uh, apparently the line X, you can have it at colored uh, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And there's guys out there that spray the entire Jeeps and off-road vehicles we'll with that with stuff. It. So because it won't scratch or chip mm -hmm. or anything else, but. I don't know. It. Uh, I haven't gone there yet. Uh, uh, most of the undersides of the cars we do here, we just get painted. We use a hardened urethane paint. Uh, we we haven't built a lot of cars that have been real aggressive road course driven, or you know, I know for just like for road for just regular street driving, uh, the amount of miles that they get on them, it just seems fine. We haven't yeah, had any issues. Much easier to clean. Yeah, and that's that's the big thing is yeah. you know, if you if you uh, we can put it on the lift, we can hose it off, we can you know clean up all the uh, the debris and everything in a, in a matter of moments. But uh, it makes it a lot easier to uh, just maintain if it's just painted okay. and and uh, okay, we have. Some new questions in. Let's see, Jerry. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. Uh, what is a good model for my first build out? Need something as a beginner. Um, cars that are easy to get parts for. Yeah, I was just going to say. And, you know, because the difference is, it, especially as a beginner, you know, I would probably gravitate towards the. Uh, uh, well, and I, uh, even Mustangs are pretty easy. They're coming Must back. Mustangs are easy because there's lots of part suppliers. You can buy an entire Mustang 67 fastback body without ever owning a 67 Mustang. Uh, you can, and the same with the Camaros. And, a body. Uh, and the, the, the GMA body stuff, you know, is, is good. It has lots of support. Uh, but only not so much soon as you get away from Chevelle. Yeah. You know, as soon as you go to the Buicks and the right. Oldsmobile, a lot of a lot of stuff gets a little harder to get a hold of. It's still out there. You know, the Camaro. You know, the easiest ones to build are going to be Mustangs, Camaros, Firebirds. Uh, if you want to go older than that, fifty uh, try five Chevys. Uh, Fifty-five, six, seven Chevys are a ton of parts available again you can buy an entire body without ever having to own one uh if you want to go uh and you know even if you do buy a really nice clean car or even if you buy one that just needs some you know even if you don't plan on buying an entire body the fact that the parts are available and that you can buy uh fenders you can buy doors you can buy you know, all these little things, there are always, you know, there's always going to be a few parts that are going to have to chase, you know, like, uh, even on the Tri-5 Chevys, there's a few parts, there's some little window flipper things that, you know, kind of a little flip out rain gutter that, you know, on the hard tops and stuff like that, that are, that make it a little harder on some cars. So kind of, kind of look at what's available before you make any kind of buying decision. But uh, that would be my the first ones that would come out. And if you want to go really old Model A's, Model yeah. A's, there's a ton of parts, 32 Fords, ton of parts. You can buy a body for those. Uh, you know, even 40 Fords, they have, you know, there's a gentleman making full 40 Ford coupe bodies. You could, you know, build one of those without having to uh, 
actually buy one. So there are a few, you know, the there a lot of times they're cars that are going to cost you a little bit of money. Actually, Model A's have become more affordable because a lot of the guys that were really big in the Model A's and 30s and 40s are starting to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not around. And uh, so it's actually become more affordable. Some of the early street rod stuff has been real bargain uh, prices on some of that stuff. So uh, just my own observation is that, you know, the street rod market's a little soft right now. So if, uh, if I wanted to get in, you know, if I, I'd, I'd look at a Model A maybe, you know, if you wanted something that old. So that would be kind of where I'd start. I would start with Model A's, uh, the 32 Fords, of course, and then Tri-5 Chevys, and then Mustangs, Camaros. The Mopar stuff's always expensive. Way out there. Yeah. So, um, or anything that, you know, the Mopar stuff, anything that you want. You know, and then you know the the uh, and they they don't have as much support, but they do have good support for some of their popular models. Um, and the AMC stuff is just tough. That's just hard. Yeah. No matter what you look at, I, I I would you know, I'd advise against that. Uh, a lot of the AMC stuff just because of that. Okay, Bruce writes in that. Uh, I've been trying to sell an old 62 Chevy C60. Uh, that's a big truck. a big truck. For some time now with no luck on eBay and others. Would parting it out and listing OEM part numbers on eBay be the best way to go or not? That's a good question. Yeah, in, in the big trucks, the big trucks, you know, the, I'm not going to say they're not desirable, and you'll find there. I know there's guys that collect. You know, I, I've got, I had some old one and a half ton international stuff here for a while that uh, you know, guy drove like out of their way to get this stuff. But uh, you know, the big truck can be. It's a tough market, you know. Uh, there's been some popularity on the street rod side of it because a lot of guys are taking some of those big trucks and putting pickup boxes on it and right, shortening right. up the frames and, and building them that way. Uh, would you be the rat rod guys that build the big diesels? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's not, you know, but, uh, I don't, you know, whether you can make enough money, just parting it out. My experience is, is that a lot of the big truck parts um it, it's tough stuff to move it's it, it'd be to, i would say it would be easier to move a whole vehicle yes. than it would be to try to move all the individual parts unless you're in no hurry um i would suggest yeah trying to sell the whole thing i would yeah that my my in my gut you know i i understand yeah maybe ebay's not working for you um there, there, uh, there are other options to eBay. eBay's good in that you get lots of exposure, but it doesn't necessarily always move stuff. I think eBay's not as good as it once was. Uh, Craigslist has gotten harder since they started charging for ads. Uh, but, you know, there's still the Craigslist side of it. There's still Facebook marketplace yeah, ads. It's become high. That's become yeah. you know kind of popular with uh, a lot of car guys. Um, also, if you know some vehicles, uh, what I found over the years, some vehicles I can't advertise to get anybody to buy them. But if I put them out where some place where people can see them, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's that case of people don't know what they want until they see it. You know, and and I've had a few cars, you know, that uh, where I've actually. You know, I, I tried for months to try to sell them. Uh, I had a, that 69 Cadillac limo for a while that I just could not move. It was a lot of car. It was six miles to the gallon. And, uh, and I listed it everywhere that I could imagine, and I could not move it. And then finally, I, you know, drove, you know, 250 miles to uh, swap meet in it. And... Uh, 
And when I got up there, the guy, a guy came up and he saw it and he just fell in love with it and had to own it right there. Although his condition was, is, you know, I had to drive it to his place. And it was like, all right, you know, I had friends that were also attending the swap meet. So I kind of figured, okay, we find out where his place is and then I can, you know, maybe figure out a way to get home kind of thing. Well, it turned out that uh, the, where he lived was like 20 miles from my home. So, uh, so even though I had advertised it locally for a long time and was not getting any bites on it, as soon as he saw it in person, he had to have it. And uh, at that point, you know, it was just a matter of driving it home and, you know, getting, you know, and driving. People don't know they need it yeah. until they actually see it, and then they can fall in love with it. It's that like love of iron kind of thing. In the four by four trucks, you know, the motor guys, they might not, you know. Oh yeah, they, they might love a you yeah. know, an, older, uh, truck like an older truck like that. You know, you you heavy duty truck body. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, okay, John uh, has a question. He would like to know. What's a good rear end gear ratio for normal driving? I rescued a 57 or 55 Bel Air from a field and it seems someone put 411s in it somewhere along the line. Well, that's not uncommon for the year. Uh, 55, they still weren't that interested in making cars go really fast, but they always had like tons of torque. <laughs> You could pull stumps with gear. it. It's a fun gear, and and you know, yeah, 411. If you've got enough motor to propel it, it's a it's a great straight way to straight go. Gear. But yeah, I can see where you'd want to move that up. What's a great rear end for that? Um, Depends on transmission. Yeah, kind of transmission. yeah, yeah. Rear end gear for that, I would guess Eight that you would want. You know, a lot of a lot of ours we build between you know mid 300s, a lot of 350 gears, 341s. Uh, if you want something that, you know, going to give you, uh, if you've got an, if you've changed your transmission, you got an overdrive, you know, 273, or 373s. 273s, are, and, good gear you know, with overdrive. And, you know, so, uh, a lot of, you know, could they've actually, a lot of cars will run, uh, you know, in my 35 Chevy, I have 350 gears in there with uh, overdrive. And, you know, that gives me, you know, 26 miles a gallon on the freeway when I stick, keep my foot out of it. When's that? <laughs> <laughs> it could happen. Yeah. It could happen. Uh, but generally, I'd say three, 350s if you're running a three-speed automatic or something. Yeah. Even 323 isn't bad. Yep. Yep. And uh, if you're just planning on going interstate cruising, you know, maybe you want to look at 308s or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, and get it down so you get some really awesome gas mileage. You're not concerned with burning the rubber off tires. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of depends on what you have for your whole setup. Uh, uh, you know, I know back then, pretty much they were manuals or power glide. Yeah, two speed power glide. Yeah. So, so you don't want really highway gears on a power glide. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. You don't want to be, you don't want to like not get off the line, which right. is a lot of cases why a lot of those had really low rear end gears was the fact that you had a two speed power glide. Yeah. So you know you had to get up to speed. You had to get that thing moving yeah. with that uh, with what you had there. The uh, so that that would be our recommendation, John. Thanks for the question. Appreciate it. The uh, Whoops, now I messed up my, my phone here. Never mind me. I'm just playing with my phone like most 14 year old girls. The uh, uh, moving forward. Oh, you got another one there? This one is from Leroy. And it looks like you have a 61 Falcon 170 cubic inch. I take it it's a straight six. Yep. While driving with stall and vapor lock, normal temps show on the gauge until I shut it off. Well, that's normal. They'll heat up when you shut them off. But yep. the temp gauge pegs total hot, no coolant flowing to the radiator, change the stat from 160 to 180, still stalling, overheating, no flow. Put 160 back in, same problem. Remove stat. Uh, I mean, you remove the thermostat and you run the engine coolant flows through radiator and engine. 
Yeah, a lot of times if you remove the thermostat, the the problem is is that there's no restriction. Yeah, a lot of times the engine will run cold then because the fluid is going through so fast. Sometimes they'll overheat if the engine is prone to overheat because then it will go yeah. so fast that it doesn't get a chance to cool down in the radiator. It looks like you tested the thermostat and water and it checked out okay. Is there any heat getting to that stat? You know, is it, I mean, the more it heats from the bottom, so. Yeah. But I guess it just depends. Yeah, it sounds, it's not a flow problem because well, it sounded like he tested his thermostat and it was opening and closing, and and I know when we were kind of we looked at this earlier and we thought, well, maybe what the problem is is the you know in it. make sure it's not upside down. Make sure you don't have your thermostat in backward. Uh, it it happens, you know. No matter how much we do, you know, we try to think that we you know don't make dumb mistakes, and and uh, I think we've all made them at one point or another. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not it's not what we intend to do going out, but sometimes you get in a hurry and you and you you're not thinking about what you're doing, and the next thing you know, you have a uh, thermostat that's in upside down, and it there's no way for it to open because the, uh, heat's, not because the heat's not getting to it. So, you know, that was our first thought, and uh, but after that, you know. If, if we knew that the thermostat was properly installed, you know, there's a number of things you should probably check, you know, make sure, you know, make sure that your radiator is uh, properly. It sounds like he's getting circulation without it, so. Yeah. Sounds like water pump okay, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, if it is know. overheating, then I would almost go back to a no flow in the radiator. I mean, it might be going to the radiator, but you're not getting good circulation through the radiator. Yeah, or maybe it needs maybe it needs like additional like a like an engine or a fan shroud or something like that. They get that's idle. Yeah, radiating. if he's yeah. It, normally, normally you get above 35 miles an hour, your fan's not doing anything anyways right. because right. you got enough air coming through your radiator to cool your. Uh, so it's only it's only below that. So if your engine's overheating when you're idling and stuff like that, fan shroud's always a good idea uh, because that ensures that you're drawing air around the through the entire. And a lot room. of them in sixty ones didn't have them. Shroud. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. In even yeah, going back into the fifties, yeah. it was like only the Just air conditioned cars would have yeah. uh, a shroud on them. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be, you know, uh, our first thing to check there would be make sure you have the thermostats incorrect. Uh, I know it seems obvious, but in the, the sort of the big ground side with the spring needs to go toward the engine, the pointy side needs to go away from the engine toward the radiator. So I always think of that, you know, the pointy end of your thermostat should be pointing toward the radiator, whether it be up, mounted up on top. Straight in some cases, they're mounted down below, you know depending on where it is. So, uh, but it, you know, if, if, if that's proper, then, you know, I'd say start exploring other parts of the cooling system, make sure you're, uh, you know. I, mean, I don't know if he tried it without and ran it down because I didn't see that here, but did it overheat without the stat in it? Because if that tells you, then it's a full problem. Obviously. Yeah. 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 Very true. Okay. I have another question in here. Um, uh, just curious, where do I find new connectors for column harnesses or spade plugs? I'm rewiring a 68 Torino fastback and would like to reuse the harness pieces to, or is it better to uh, make, a, make a connection from the new wiring harness to the old wires and then use the original connectors. Well, you can use the original connectors. There's, you know, if they're in good shape and, you know, you, there's nothing wrong with reusing old connectors. Um, although, if you want to go all new, if you're wiring something new in, you know, you can always go with a new connector. You can, you know, there's companies like uh, American Auto Wire uh, has, uh, and that's AmericanAutoWire.com or even Painless Performance. Uh, just a couple of the companies that come to mind right away that have uh, steering connectors, all the original kind of factory type style connectors, uh, and they'll have all the crimp on connections and everything else. So it's a you know it's a good idea. Check with them. Uh, you know, I'm, if 68 Torino is not so rare, it probably uses 
those same connectors as yeah, yeah, well, we a lot of other Fords of that Mustang, year, like the Mustangs, yeah. and, and you know they'll, they're, they'll support those. So, yeah, uh, I would, you know, as long, you know, the, the connectors themselves are not very expensive. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to just replace them and, and put new connectors in your car at that time anyways. The, uh, I'm reset my phone here, so... Hopefully it tells me something new. The uh, next we have a uh, uh, member who wrote in. He says, "I think what I, I I have what I think is a '57 Chevy 150 Black Widow. Is there any way I can verify that it is?" Um, what is a Black Widow to start with? Black Widow was a car especially, uh, well, they weren't built by Chevrolet. They were sent to a company called Sedco, and they were modified for use by NASCAR. Uh, back NASCAR back in the day used to be primarily stock cars. So um, they, they, weren't, they weren't like the, the NASCARs of today, which right. resemble nothing that ever was on a on a uh, um, ever in a showroom floor or any on a lot. So uh, the Black Widows were just stripped down, you know, V8 uh, Chevrolet 150 sedans that uh, went to Sedco and they would, they modified them with a whole bunch of parts, you know, including uh, one of the easiest ways for you know to to pick up on them right away is they had six bolt front and rear axles in them and uh so you know i know a lot of guys like to think that they have a black widow or something but if it unless it has like the six bolt rear axle and the six bolt front axles uh you know it's it you know unless it's been converted or swapped back um that's usually a, a sure indication. They also they had a lot of other things that were bolt on stuff. You know, they they ran limousine brakes in them. They had Cadillac radiators in them. They had, you know, uh, four. They had additional shocks on all four corners to stiffen them up. Some they had, you know, Fenton exhaust manifolds. They even ran the exhaust through the frame rails. Uh, you know, so the car, you know, the cars were bouncing down the race tracks and stuff that the exhaust wouldn't hang up on stuff. So is there ways to tell, you know, you, you can, you know, over the course of all these years, you know, a lot of this stuff has probably changed if you did find one, but there'd be some of those things to look for, you know, it, you know, does it have the fuel injected 283 in it? Does it have, you know, cause not a lot of one fifties were built with fuel injection in them. You know, mainly right. those all went in the Bel Airs yeah. and uh, you know, right. the top of the line models. So, uh, so there are some indications. You know, the six ball axles, the fuel injected two eighty threes. If any of this stuff survived, is there is there a registry? I don't know that. Uh, you know, there was only you know there was not a lot of Black Widows made in the first place. If you did have an original, it's a valuable car. car. It's a it's a very valuable car, and you know it's worthy of saving and worthy if you even if you just think it's one, yeah. it's worthy of doing the legwork to find out if it was. It'd be, you know, it wouldn't be the first time I've heard of somebody buying a car and then discovering that it was like you know a lot more valuable than what they you know, originally thought. You know, we had a friend of ours that bought a. You know, Mustang Fastback not too long ago, and and uh, discovered it was like a, a very rare drag pack car uh, with you know very unique options on it, and and what he spent you know originally bought the car for like twenty thousand dollars, and after he did the restoration and everything else, he ended up selling it for like one hundred and seventy seven thousand dollars. So uh, he made some money on it. Uh, but again, it was the kind of thing that he didn't even know what he had until he actually got into researching it and finding out exactly what he had. And it's not uncommon to, you know, hear people tell the stories of finding, uh, 
uh, cars that uh, that they thought would, uh, you know, it was just a normal everyday car. The, I'm going to quick check something here on my computer. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have another question in from a fellow member. Uh, hello, everyone. New member here. I was wondering, I have, uh, I have put my car into storage, and a good portion of the body is in bare metal. <laughs> it's stored out of the element in a steel barn, but the area is not heated. How long do I have before the bare metal starts to rust? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the gentleman lives in southwest Ontario. This temperature currently was one degree, minus Celsius. one Celsius, so that'd be like 29 degrees or so. Yeah. Um, right now, I was told it would be summer before my car can see another body shop. I was told to spray self-etching primer on the bare metal. So I'm just wondering how long the how long will the clock be ticking? Uh, uh, is it going to give me the body is uh, from California, so I'd like to keep it as close to original condition as I can. Wow, um, metal starts to rust the moment yeah. it's exposed to air. You know, that's part of the the whole process. Uh, rust is oxidation. So as soon as bare metal becomes exposed to oxygen, uh, it begins to oxidize. Um, how quickly it oxidizes, on the other hand, depends on, on how quickly it, that rust advances, depends on things like moisture in the air and temperature. And you know, if you're in a warm, humid climate, I've seen cars go from bare metal to orange overnight um what the floor is yeah the, the, the floor you know you, granted it's winter it's cold it's below freezing where you're at it's below 30 or below zero or zero degrees celsius but it's not much below and i'm sure it's going to get warmer yet you got to do something to protect it from rusting now you can't yeah. wait until you can get it into you know i'm sure you're in a metal barn and everything else my suggestion right away would be to take a quart of automatic transmission fluid and a rag and wipe down all the bare metal surfaces with ATF. That'll help seal up the surface. It'll keep it from turning orange and with a little lacquer thinner in the spring and clean rags and towels, you can get all that ATF off again. I'm not saying drip it all over your car just you're going to wipe down all your big surfaces and get some of your edges uh, so you can it prevent up. it from prevent it from oxidizing or prevent it from rusting especially now if it's it's you know if it's currently a little below freezing and it's going to get above freezing and then that moisture will be in the air as things melt and you know how humid spring gets because all the snow is melting and everything else um you want to make sure you wipe that car down now. Now is the time to do it. Um, if you can't get it into a body shop or spray it or do anything, I'm not. I'm not a big fan. I, I do like self etch primer for spot stuff in small areas. I'm not a big fan for like a, a big portion of the car. I prefer to you know clean the metal and use like a epoxy primer on it. And if you get it. A good coat of epoxy primer that'll seal it up real well. And uh, uh, but again, if you're just in a metal shed now without heat, go out there with the uh, rag and some ATF, wipe it down, and at least you know even if you do have a little bit of rust now, cover, you know wipe that down too, uh, and it'll like preserve it until it does warm up and you can address it the way that you should. The uh, uh, okay, we have Jim here who's wrote in. I have a '72 C10 GMC pickup. I had replaced the whole back corner of the cab. It was smashed in due to an accident. 
my door gaps aren't where I need them to be. I need to add some weld. Is it better to add the weld to the door or to the B pillar? When you replace the when I, when you replace the pack panel where it's welded together on the truck, I have to put a skim coat of body filler on. Do I put a skim coat on the whole panel or just where it's welded? Okay, so we have two questions here. Uh, when you're gapping doors, um, and this isn't uncommon, you know, it has become real popular now for, you know, everybody wants exact perfect door gaps. You know, they want, you know, three sixteenths or whatever all the way around their doors and everything to, you know, be uniform. So uh, the way the pro shops do it, it welds right on the edge of the door and then they grind that smooth and uh, then they that way when they're grinding it they make sure that they'll they'll use like a thin cutoff wheel on a, like a four and a half inch cutting wheel and make sure they get a nice smooth transition and then they round out the edges to make sure they have a nice gap you know and if you do it right you actually don't need any filler uh, a lot of times that you know sometimes you might need a little bit of skim on the edge you don't usually want a lot of filler on the edges yes. of doors because you want if you bang them into anything, you don't want chunks of your thing uh, of your door falling out. So usually you can do it with just welding and grinding. And uh, again, because that's a thin edge, you want to do that. You don't want to try to do the B pillars. If you do have gaps that are so bad that you got to you know you need a half inch or something, you know maybe it's a good time to cut. You know, cut that patch panel back off and readjust that patch panel because you shouldn't be welding on more than, you know, a 16th or, you know, I've seen guys go, you know, eighth inch or, you know, uh, of weld on the door to get them to fit. And I've seen cars where, you know, it depends on the car. I've seen cars where just, you know, quarter panels have been replaced and, and they really needed to modify the, like the deck lid to fit the opening when it was done. In, in depending on the car, you know, sometimes, you know, you can get away with, you know, a quarter inch of fill, but it's, it's, that should be the extreme, but not the, uh, what we should be looking for. All right. Now I can see where we're at the top of the hour now, uh, guys, I want to just say thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, really appreciate you, uh, uh, stopping by uh, and thanks for the good questions. I appreciate that. And uh, Ross is going to go back out and, you know, start up his snowmobile and you know, have fun again. And, uh, you know, I'll be in here in the shop. And uh, until next time, thanks again.